everyone. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Dear Lord, we just want to give you thanks. We give you thanks for all that you do for us, Lord. We give you thanks for the veterans who've protected and even some who gave their lives, Lord. We thanks for those here, Lord, who are willing to serve today, not in, in a foreign mission field, Lord, but to serve you here at home in our home church. We pray for our pastor, Lord, that uh, he and Emily get back safely, Lord. We pray that the stress uh, not be too much on them, Lord. And I pray that whatever purpose you have and them being stranded over there, that it would work itself out. And we know all things work together for good. Pray that you be with this service today, Lord. Pray that you would teach us all. Open our hearts and our ears. Dear Lord, we give you thanks for the people who are in the back even now uh, preparing food that we might fellowship together, Lord, and how sweet that fellowship is. And we just pray that you would be honored here, both in this service, in the thanksgiving that we have for you, Lord. We just thank you for your cross and Jesus. Be blessed, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. I hope you're all here for something other than the, uh, the, uh, the food after the service. And uh, I think the Lord has laid a message on my heart. Uh, he's really laid it uh, on my heart for me. But I'm going to share maybe a little bit of testimony and what uh, uh, the Lord has done in my life. And uh, hopefully um, uh, he might teach you something as well. Because uh, if, you're, if you're learning from me, you're learning from the wrong guy, I'll tell you that. <clears throat> so I've been married this year, it'll be 24 years. 24 years I've been married, yep, Siobhan's been with me that long. It's hard to believe, but it's true. Um, so in that time, and in those of you who've been married a while, you, you get some stories about each other, right? You have stories. And I would say that generally my wife is tired of my stories. Why? ever been in that situation where you've heard about the fish? Okay, somebody back there, yeah. The deer, whatever it was, or maybe a funny anecdote about your wife or your spouse. Well, there's a story Siobhan tells that I'm, I'm a little tired of, but I wanted to share it today. See, when I was a young man, we couldn't afford uh, a Weezer and Collie furniture, so we got our furniture, like, like most people do, from Ikea or put together from Walmart. And she tells this story. It's, it's a funny story, and I don't even know if she's in here or not today. But, oh, yeah, okay. She tells this story. I was, ho- I, I was hoping she was in the back helping with the food. But she tells this story of when I put together one of our first bookshelves that uh, me and this buddy of mine I used to hang around with, he was over helping me put together a bookshelf, and uh, there was a lot of noise, clattering, this, that, and the other thing, and somewhere along the way, I don't remember this, I came down and said, honey, where's my drill? And her, her, her response to me was, I didn't think you needed power tools to put this particular bookshelf together. And I said, just get my drill, okay? <laughs> so that's her funny story. And in all honesty, we talked about this in the, in the last few weeks, and we can't remember what happened to that bookshelf. But I'm sure wherever it is today, I am convinced that that bookshelf still stands today. (laughs) I didn't read the directions. I did use a drill. But in life, we need the directions. We need the direction of God. We need His his guidance in our life if we're to be successful as Christians. And one of the things and what I wanted to talk about today, if you were to name a sermon, I'd probably call this one Steve. But if you wanted a better name for it, I would call this, you know, what is... God's will for my life. What is God's will for my life? I don't have the gift that Pastor Rob does to give you four P's, three T's, and two S's. I'm not, I don't, I don't know, I, that just doesn't come to me that way. And he's gifted in that he can, he can make up some words that start with the letter. I'll tell you that. He, he will make it fit. But I would say that when it comes to God's will for us, and you could write this down, probably the only thing you write down, There are three things I think that God has in store for all of us. First is a relationship. God wants a relationship with us. When I look for God's will in my life, I sometimes forget. Number one, He wants a relationship between me and Him. Second would be uh, love and comfort. He wants to love and comfort His church. He does love and comfort His church. But sometimes we forget, just like uh, the love of our spouse. You know, sometimes, you know, we're looking for, we're looking for comfort, and, and it's there in front of us all the time. God, I know His will is to comfort us. He sent His Son to die for us. He wants to comfort us. And lastly, I think He wants us to change. 
right? Because we, we came into this world as sinful man, and his will, I know, for me, and I believe for you, is he wants to see an inward change brought about by the first two points, the relationship with him, and the love and the comfort that he shows us, that change inwardly that we should express outwardly. outwardly. <clears throat> so today we're going to look in Colossians. If you'd turn with me there to the book of Colossians, Paul was writing to the the church at uh, Colossae, Co- uh, one of the uh, towns, yeah. Um, to the Colossians, he wrote the church at Colossians. And in fact, he also, he mentions Laodicea there in this, uh, this very short book as well. But when I was looking, and I still look from time to time for God's will in my life, a particular verse in here caught my phrase. Now, when I was talking about directions, there was actually a point to that story. How many of you have ever seen directions for putting together a, uh, a, uh, a bookshelf? Right? Those are pretty simple. Yeah, yeah, never used them, right? How about a lawnmower? That's always a good one too, right? Because now you're talking about a, you know, a combustion engine, some gasoline, some oil. Sounds like a great time to use a drill if you ask me. But, you know, you reach a point, and as a man, women, this may or may not apply to you, and I'm being sexist, and I apologize for that up front. There's a point where I skip over the preface, right? That point where it says, caution, if you stick your finger in a socket, it could hurt you. Caution, don't smoke while you're filling this thing with gasoline. I kind of skip over that. I figure that'll be obvious to me, right? And maybe you women have that same thing. But where do you start reading the directions? And sometimes, sometimes in Paul's letter to the churches, I kind of gloss over the front part. I gloss gloss over that whole um, introduction where he's saying, hey, hey, you guys, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you, and this is what I'm praying for you. I, I kind of kind of skip to the meat, right? I skip over the cautions. But it was actually in chapter 1, verse uh, 9, where it caught my eye. It says, For this cause we also, this is Colossians 1, 9, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled. Okay, so right there, whenever I'm looking at the Paul, Pauline letters to the churches, he, he often says that I pray for you, right? So my tendency is to skip over. But this verse caught my eye because look what he prayed for them. He said that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will. I'm going to say that again. Paul is praying. I'm praying for you that you have knowledge of God's will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So when I'm looking for God's will in my life and I'm reading the Pauline letters and here's Paul saying, hey, by the way, I'm praying for you, church, that you understand God's will. Wouldn't it make sense that the letter he's about to follow up with would then tell them, hey, here's a good clue about what God's will is for you. Right? And so it caught my eye and so I did it. I studied hard in Colossians about understanding the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Verse 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing and being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Paul prayed for the churches at Colossae and Laodicea that they might know God's will. And the question is, and it really follows up there, why? Why did he want them to know God's will? It's right there in verse 10 where it says that you might walk worthy of the Lord into all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God for good work's sake. For good work's sake. If, I, if you really get down to the heart of what is God's will for your life, the heart of it, the heart of it is going to be to be fruitful for Him. Because in being fruitful for Him, we ourselves find satisfaction. But let's, let's not take my word for it. I'm kind of skipping to the end, right? But let's see how we get, how I get to being fruitful for the Lord. So the first thing we mentioned was a relationship. All right? So um, if you scroll down a little bit there in that same chapter, uh, we say... Uh, Uh, In verse 20. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. In verse 18. It says, And he, the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, 
that in all things he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. All right? I want to know God's will for my life. <clears throat> but I really already know God's will for my life, don't we? Don't we know that God sent His Son, Jesus, to die on the cross so that we might enter into a relationship for Him? So when they're asking, I, Lord, what is Your will for my life? A lot of times we already know the answer and that it is a relationship with Christ. All right? And, and if you go back to verse 15, it says, Who is the image, the speaking of Christ, the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. We were created for him. All right. So stay, stay with me here. All right. <clears throat> And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence, for it pleased the Father, that in him should all fullness dwell. Turn back a few, uh, few chapters to Ephesians. Ephesians. All right? Ephesians chapter 1, again, in the early parts of that book. One verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So here was another clue I had skipped over. Both in Colossians and in Ephesians, Paul was writing, and it sounds very similar there. Why is he praying? Why is he writing? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom, that we might have wisdom and revelation into the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened. So we get it. So we get it. That's what Paul was praying for. That you might know what is the hope of his calling. What were we called to do? And what riches the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of the power to usward who believe according to the work of his mighty power? Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead set him at his own hand in the heavenly places, far above the principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in the world which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fulfilleth all in all. Now that's a lot of words. That's a lot of words. But, but what I found, what I saw, was in Colossians and in Ephesians, it talks about this world. It talks about principalities and powers. How many of you knew we had an election not that long ago? All right? All right? Now, keep your hand up. Some of you are lying. Because I'm pretty sure when you were watching football, there was a commercial scoundreling somebody. All right, keep your hand up. All right? How many of you were worried about the outcome of that election? Go ahead. It's all right. Oh, come on now. You were worried about that. Good. All right. So some of you are truthful, and I appreciate that. All right. How many of you, keep your hands up if you were worried about that. How many of you think God was worried about the outcome of that election? <laughs> My dad. <laughs> Thanks for being honest, Dad. I love you. Okay. God wasn't worried. Why? Because God, Jesus, preeminence above more worthwhile, is over all powers and principalities. We get worried and concerned. What is the will for my life? Should I be a Democrat that loves his brother and other people? Should I be a Republican who's more concerned with, you know, working hard and getting what you deserve? Is that what God's concerned in my life? What is his will for me to be a Republican and a Democrat? He said, I don't care. I'm over all of that. He said, I will take care of the powers. He said, he said to Pilate, he said, you know what? You have no authority over me yet given to you by God. He's not worried about who the next president of the United States or the Europeans or, or Australia, Germany, Russia, China. He doesn't care. Or North Korea, for that matter. I just get everybody. All right? He doesn't care. He's, he's preeminent. He's over all of that. But if you look, you might miss it. If you don't look, it says, far above, verse 21 in Ephesians, far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Not just today, but forever. He will be in charge. Verse 22, he hath put all things under his feet, all things, and gave him, so there's a, there's a comma there, and, oh by the way, 
out of all these powers and principalities which he's over, and he gave him to be the head over all things to the church, to us, his body. Verse 23, which is his body, the fullness of of him that fills all in all. Now that's a little tough. The fullness of things that fills all in all. The fullness of things. That fullness is not that Jesus needs his people to complete him. We obviously need him to complete us, right? But we are to complement him. We are to be his glory here on earth. We are to be his bride. Isaiah 62.5 says, As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. This was Isaiah, and he was talking about the redeemed church, the redeemed of Israel at that time, right? But we have been grafted into Israel through Jesus Christ's blood. Verse, uh, Isaiah 54.5 says, For thy maker is thy husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. In God's will for us, we, the church, are his biggest concern. He's concerned about our troubles. He's concerned about our inward parts. He's concerned about our growth. He thinks about us always and continually. We are never off of his mind. The relationship between us and Christ is the foremost for us to be in his will. Why? Because he loves us. And we as Americans, and not just Americans, it's just more prevalent to us, we as a people have taken marriage and and thrown it way out of proportion. We have no idea God's understanding of marriage, I believe. Not only just the gay and homosexual community and and, uh, the divorce rate being 50%, and if you're divorced in here, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but if you're not divorced or have never been divorced, don't look so high and mighty, because I guarantee you, Times you wanted to strangle your wife because I've been married for 24 years, and I'm sure it's vice versa. God made our spouse to be a helpmate, a glory to each other. The bride is to be a glory for the husband, and that's when he compares the church to the Savior. We are to be his glory. Our actions are to bring him glory. Relationship is the first thing when you look for the will of God in your life. You start with the relationship. Very good. Number two, going back to Colossians. I have to catch up on my notes so I don't miss something. Oh, there is ketchup on my notes. Sorry about that. My bad. This is all good, but let's come back to understanding. Yeah, I get it. We're supposed to be saved. We're supposed to accept the Savior of glory who's willing to save us from damnation. We make light of it, right? Yeah, but what else? What else am I supposed to get? Well, I really need some direction here. And this is me talking, right? This is me talking. Okay, God, I got this salvation thing down. Now I need to know what you want me to do. How do I get him to help me in my daily circumstances? Chapter 2, verse 2 in Colossians. See, after the relationship, this is what I think Paul was trying to write to the churches there. And I'll start in verse 1 of chapter 2. It says, For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them of Laodicea. For as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and into all riches of the fullness, excuse me, of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ. So first thing, it sounded to me when I first read that like Paul was being very vain. If you read Paul and you don't really understand his heart, it sounds like he's a little, he's like the Germans. He's a little pompous. And if you're German in here, I apologize. A little arrogant, you know. I don't think Paul was saying that in seeing his face, the church at Colossae was going to suddenly be comforted, knit together in love. I don't think that's what Paul was writing at all. He was saying, I wanted to see their face and be able to tell them about this relationship that if you're in it, your hearts are going to be filled with love. You understand the love of Christ, your heart is going to be full of love. And into the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. If you would have asked me 10 years ago, 5 years ago, maybe 3 years ago, to stand up here and try and explain that verse to you, I would have laughed. 
I would have laughed. How does a man stand up here and try and explain the mystery of God? Let's read verse 2 again very carefully. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and to all the riches of full assurance. Full assurance. Of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God. What is the mystery of God? What is that? It's a mystery, right? I'm not supposed to get it. Look back in, in, in uh, chapter 1, verse 26. It says, Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. He's about to tell you what the mystery is in verse 27. You want to know what the mystery of God is? To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's God's mystery. How did God's Son come down here? Did He really mean the promises that He spoke? Now here's the deal. If I was to ask you to raise your hand if you believe the Bible is true, how many raise your hand? Is the Bible true? Is it all true? Is it just kind of true? All right, put your hand down. So here's the deal. If you believe the Bible is true, then you have hope in Jesus Christ. That He's over all principalities. That He's got the world, He's got the whole world in His hands, right? And yet, when we fear for who's going to be elected, when we fear when we get a, a bad response from the doctor, when we fear, when we fear, when we fear, do you really believe God is in control or do you not? When I'm looking for the will of God in my life, the most common stumbling block I come to is my own unbelief. My own fear. Because here's the deal. When I pray for direction, it is true from time to time. I, don't, I, haven't, done, I haven't crunched the numbers. I'm an engineer. I haven't crunched the numbers. I don't know. It's 50%, 40%. But I know this. There are times when God answers me directly. Do this. And my mind goes to... I can't face that giant. I, I don't want to tell my wife that's what you told me. Why? Because she'd hit me. <laughs> Fear. Here's the thing. Next verse after, after that in chapter 2. In whom are hid all the treasure. Okay, so let's read verse 2 just to bring us back. That their hearts might be comforted. That our hearts, through our relationship with Christ, might be comforted. That's the next step. God wants us to be comforted in full assurance. He wants us to be sure of His grace, of His love, of that mystery that Jesus did die on a cross. Be sure of it. Be confident. Knit together in love and all riches, the fullness of... uh, uh, Sorry, I keep losing my place. The full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. Verse 3. Here it comes. Here it comes. You ready? Verse 3. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You want to know God's uh, uh, plan for your life? It's that wisdom and knowledge that are treasurable. Turn with me to Matthew 13, 44. I'll just read it. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to. Matthew 13, 44. I've used this before in a few of my servants. Uh, apparently, I don't learn enough from it. So God keeps bringing me back to it over and over. Again, the kingdom... This is Jesus speaking, Matthew 13, 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in the field, that which when a man hath found it, or woman, he hideth it, and for the joy thereof goes and sells all that he has and buyeth that field when that fear strikes you here's what it comes down to is God's word true and is it worth more to you than anything else this world has to offer do you trust God that much because the will for God in your life is to give him your life we died on that cross we are dead to our trespasses and sins through him his blood and when we want to know God's will for us The question is, what are you going to do with it when he tells you? Are you going to man up or woman up and pick up five smooth stones in a sling to go face a giant? Are you going to sell the house or cash in your 401k because God says that's what you should do? 
Are you going to take in an adopted family or adopted kids? Well, I was going to adopt one, but there's five of them. I don't want to break up the set. What are they, steak knives? Your family knows, don't they? If you ask for God's will in your life, don't be surprised when He tells you. And if you're far along, Christians, in your spiritual life, don't be surprised if it involves lack of comfort for you or suffering. But the question is, when he says, I'll give you strength, did he mean it? The question is, when he said, don't lay up for yourselves treasures here where rust comes and moth destroys, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, did he mean it? It is a crisis of belief that when you ask, God, what is your will for my life? You're going to have to face. I have to face. We all have to face. We all have to face the fact that when we want God's will in our life, when we're asking, why? Why do we ask? Why do you want to know God's will for your life? That's what he asked me. And so I'm asking you. Is it so you're smart? Is it so we can sit on the first or second pew in the church and say, I know God's will for my life. I figured it out. Or is it so you can do it? I mean, that is the point, right? If we go back to what was Paul's prayer for this church in Colossae, he said, it is that you come to the full knowledge. And now I have to go back. I hate to paraphrase. Colossians. Not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will, all wisdom and spiritual understanding, so you can feel good about yourself? Is that what it says? No. Verse 10 says that ye might walk worthy of the Lord and pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. You want to do the will of God so you increase in fruitfulness and knowledge of God. I do His will. I understand Him more. He and I grow closer. That's God's will for every Christian. Every Christian. Now my notes are off again and i got more ketchup. All the treasures. And that's going to come up again at the end of the sermon. That thing about are we willing... To sell all that we have. And as a Christian, you know, I all, the first thing I always went to was, does God want me to sell my house? Should I do like the early church and we should just all live on a big commune? It's a good question. But I don't think now, looking back, that that's what God meant. Doesn't mean He may not ask you to do it. But that's not what was meant by that heaven is like parable. Chapter 2, verse 8 through 12. Chapter 2 of Colossians, verse 8 through 12. So we have the relationship. Why do we have a relationship that we can have full knowledge and assurance and being knit together in love with our brothers and sisters? Beware, verse 8, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and after the rudiments of this world and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of of the Godhead bodily, bodily. And you are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. So no power over us, only Christ. In verse 11 it says, In whom you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with Him in baptism, wherein also you were risen with Him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. So, okay. He did all that. His will for us is to enter a relationship to him, to know his fullness and his love for his church. And now he wants an inward change. Your God desires for you an inward change. Right? It's what baptism is all about. I know this is, this is not new things to some of you. He said, but it, it's not about an outward change of circumcision. He said it's about a change in your inward parts. It's not done with hands. It is death to the old self and life in Christ. We are a new creature in Christ. So an inward change. Hello? <laughs> Sound like my doorbell. <clears throat> An inward change is what He wants in us. It's the next step in God's will for us. 
In verse, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Still in Colossians. You guys are changing a lot of pages. I thought I went Revelation or something. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sets on the right hand of God. Set your affection on the things above, not on the things of this earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him. All of those three things, trusting in Christ, trying to be fruitful for him, loving and being knit together in love, and then inward change that draws us more and more like him is all for this goal. It's all for this goal here in chapter 3. That ye be risen with Christ, seek those things that are above, where Christ sets on the right hand. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Verse 4 should be the summation of what we want out of our life. And I'm not going to run too much more into turkey time, so bear with me just one more minute, all right? When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him. Let's go back to why do you want to know the will of God? I am not a full-time pastor. I have had the privilege to sit in a hospital with a few people who were on their way to meet Jesus. And the scariest thing I've ever heard is for a lady who's been in church and I knew and I loved very dearly, she said, I'm scared. I'm scared to go to the other side. I'm scared to face the judgment. I'm scared to go see Jesus. Do you think that's what God wants for us? Do you think that's what God's will is for our life, is to be scared when that time comes? The will of our Lord in my life, and I believe in every Christian's life, is to have that calm assurance it talks about in verse 4. We were changed. You were dead in verse 3. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then ye shall also appear with him. You want, when I asked, why do you want to know his will? One of the things, one of the reasons I wanted to know God's will for my life is because I don't want to answer why I became an engineer when I was supposed to be a pastor. Why I became uh, uh, an X when I was supposed to be a Y. I thought that God was concerned more with my occupation than He was my spiritual condition. And God showed me that's not the case. God showed me that His will for my life is to know Him, to be fruitful for Him, to love the brotherhood, to be knit together with you poor people who are stuck with me in your church. And then to have that calm assurance. And when my time comes to know that I had done my best for God and He will say to me, good and faithful servant. That's his will for me. Now I will say one other thing. There are times when the will of God is for you to take action. Okay? Go with me one place. It's a verse you all have heard and I'm skipping over my notes but I'm, I'm out of time, I think. Micah 6.8 says, What does the Lord require of you? That kind of touched me when I was looking for the will in my life. What is it God wants of me? Micah says, what does the Lord require of you? That you act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. To act justly. I can do that in any occupation. To love mercy. That's harder for me. But I can do that with God's help anywhere in the world. And the only action verb is to walk humbly. And there will come a time when you, you do, we do, have to make decisions about our life. And we should pray. Right? And sometimes, every time, 100% of the time, to me, it's always been one of two results. No answer, which I have learned means wait. 
if at all possible, wait. Wait, wait, wait. Or in my own life, I found that God did direct me. He told me. And I was not willing to go. God will not be fooled. When I stand before Jesus, if I tell Him, well, Lord, You didn't give me an answer, He'll say, you understand I made you, right? I gave you the thoughts you have for the most part. I read them. I know what you're doing. And when you say to God, you didn't give me an answer, and he says, I gave you an answer. You were just too scared of Siobhan to tell her. <laughs> Don't lie to God about what he has or has not answered your prayer with. It all comes back to that crisis of belief. If he tells you to pack up and go, you go. And the real point of the parable of Jesus speaking, saying the kingdom is like unto a treasure hid in a field that you sell everything, is that if he asks you to, you do it. Because we all raise our hand and say the Bible's true. I trust in Jesus as long as he doesn't ask me to sacrifice. I trust in Jesus as long as it's not the cross. One more thing and then I'll close. I skipped it, but it was an awesome verse. When we have an inward change in our life, go to Colossians chapter 2 and God, I, He just put this on, my, it's such a powerful verse and I've missed it for years. Chapter 2 verse 14 I'll start in 13, but it says, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened, hath he brought back to life, together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses. Verse 14. Here it is. Ready? Most powerful verse. You don't remember anything else? Eric just rattled on all day. I don't know what he, I don't know what he was talking about. Verse 14 says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Nailing it to his cross. God's will for my life and your life is not religion. Because he took religion and he nailed it to his cross. His life was given for us so that we would act justly, love mercy, and walk with our God. 